Welcome back to our uh, Socially Engaged Philosophy YouTube channel. Um, it's been a while since we did our last recording, summer break, um, but it's a great pleasure today to welcome an old friend um, onto this channel, um, Professor Veli Mitova from the University of Johannesburg, and we'll do a session on epistemic col colonization and epistemic injustice. Welcome, Veli. Nice to see you. You too. So let me say a few words by way of introduction. So as I said, Veli is a professor at the University of Johannesburg in philosophy. She works on epistemology, on metaethics, the philosophy of action. Um, one of her uh, particular essential themes is the nature of evidence on which she has published a monograph and also an anthology. And more recently, she has broadened out into topics in political epistemology, political and social epistemology, and in particular, epistemic injustice. She's also a participant in this global project, Geography of Philosophy, and we will talk about this a bit towards the end. Okay, I guess one natural way to begin is to talk a bit about your biography, um, Veli, because um, you know, seeing where all you have been, born in Bulgaria, um, taught in South Africa, lived in South Africa, then lived in the UK for a PhD, in Vienna, in Mexico, and now in South Africa. How has that trajectory of your biography influenced your philosophical interests? Um, yeah, uh, interesting question. Thanks. First of all, thank you. Thank you for having me. I think this is a very important series, and I'm very happy that philosophy is getting more more publicly engaged. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I mean, I, uh, when I arrived in South Africa, it's the kind of education that that I got was basically the British one, um, and it was amazing for me to to get interested in epistemology as though um, I didn't leave, live at the at the dawn of democracy, right? Because uh, that's when I got um, educated. In, I started my education in 96, uh, and the first democratic elections in, in South Africa were in 94. So it was very weird to, to get interested in, in classical epistemology, British style, then to go to Cambridge and to discover that, you know, that there's no difference between what I've been doing um, um, and the UK. Um, and it was um, then you who started, actually, you're the culprit, um, at chipping away uh, at my rabid and then rabid anti-feminism anti uh, uh, in during my stay in Vienna uh, that that started prodding me in the direction of political epistemology um, uh, and it's it was returning then in South Africa in 2015 um, slap back in the middle of the roads must fall and fees must fall movements that uh, finally <clears throat> And pushed me in that direction, even though at the time I was writing the book on, on, on evidence. So it was really interesting to, to come back, first of all, having been educated as a you know, British style, um, then come back to a university that's uh, first generation mostly, university students, uh, some of them on meal coupons that poor, the university is providing food for them, and do it during uh, Peace Must Fall. Um, and, and then it was, I, I suddenly, I couldn't do this anymore. This epistemology, straight epistemology was suddenly didn't make sense to live here and, and to do this. Um, and, and that's how I got interested. I gave my first class in philosophy of race and then quickly it became the ethics of race and then uh, epistemic injustice. Um, and, and now I'm primarily working on epistemic injustice and uh, decolonization. Mm -hmm. Great. Fascinating, fascinating trajectory, um, which, which um, raises a question for me, um, you mentioned in coming back to South Africa and the political climate and this, you know, change, the fundamental change that was going on at the time. How do these big political changes in South Africa in general reflect itself in the universities in general and in philosophy in particular? I mean, I think I'm thinking of debates over, over curricula, um, who should be on the reading list, teaching formats, the language issue, I guess, is, a, is, a, is an important element as well. Could you talk a little bit sure. about that? Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, so, so the, the, firstly, the most amazing thing is that it took so long uh, for these things to really start, to, to start percolating into, into our ways of thinking. Uh, 
um, and, and that roads must fall and all of these things only happened in 2015. Um, but I mean, the debates in, in terms of in the, in the academy were already uh, alive and well. Uh, and it's just a matter of how much actual change was happening. So some of the, some of the issues that were addressed um, and, and one of the things that happened in, in the wake of um, um, the roads must fall movement and so on, the following year was something called science must fall. Uh, so um, <laughs> uh, a student from the University of Cape Town gave a little uh, rant, well, what some people considered a rant and then became a viral video uh, on, on how science is actually responsible for, for colonization and how if we really want to decolonize knowledge, we should, um, uh, we should really scrap science altogether. And of course, you know, the, the connections between science and, and racism and, and colony and slavery and so on. Uh, uh, very well known, uh, but but this is kind of how it 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 started actually getting really really heard. Uh, all of the stuff about epistemic decolonization, to my mind at least, um, and it really forced people to in the academy to start taking it seriously, because until I mean, it's not true that until then we were solely teaching Western stuff, but but basically in a, in a normal philosophy department, uh, as I said, in my education, certainly, there was the odd African philosophy course or the odd African philosophy reading and stuff, and stuff like this. So, so, the, so one of the first debates was, um, was as you say, a, about curriculum and how seriously we should take and how pervasive uh, the change of curriculum should be. Um, and then other, I mean, other, you know, the broader transformation issues as well about staff, uh, we, you know, still very much the, the, the um, senior people in the academy are white. Uh, and that's fortunately changing nowadays, uh, but very slowly. Uh, uh, space issues, um, if you saw my university, for example, it looks like, a, uh, like one of those old laggers that, that the, uh, the Boers used to defend their, their, their families in. Uh, and uh, the Witwatersrand next door looks like, a, like, like, you know, like, a, Pantheon and so on. So, so space issues, you know, this is not a, a, a good space for, for an African student to be going to university, right? So that's another, another debate. It's, it's just not home. Um, uh, for, I mean, for anyone, actually, it's not, it's yeah. not home. For, but, but apart from that, you know, uh, and, 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 and then, uh, I mean, the language issue, as you, as you said, and, and we've done some, some work at my department, um, um, and it's becoming increasingly, it's not just in philosophy, but also across disciplines. Uh, the idea that if we're going to take decolonization seriously, we need to uh, take seriously the indigenous languages. Uh, so you can't just uh, teach, um, uh, you know, uh, philosophy in, in English, because as we already taught us a long time ago, uh, imposing the concepts uh, is, well, imposing the areas of interest, right? And, and what you find in truly philosophical. Um, so, so that's another, another issue. And we're actually doing some, some interesting um, uh, work at, at my department and, and the center at which, at which I direct, um, the African Center for Epistemology and Philosophy of Science, uh, in compiling a dictionary uh, that to begin with, we're, we're uh, translating um, existing entries in Isizulu at the moment. Uh, and then we're going to be soliciting um, um, entries from, from African philosophy, philosophers across Africa on distinctively uh, African concepts. So, so, that, so that, that's, those are the kinds of debates, uh, debates in academia uh, more broadly. And in philosophy, of course, there's the, um, 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 the, the, the issue of what place African philosophy should have um, to a great extent. Mm. And that was, a, I mean, that was a debate for a long time, whether African, there's such a thing as African philosophy. So unfortunately, that debate is over now by, by the looks of it, because, uh, uh, yeah. And, and, and there's some emerging skepticism um, about the whole epistemic decolonization, uh, theorizing epistemic decolonization. So I'm working on a piece at the moment uh, that's um, a philosopher from, from uh, the University of Kazulu Natal, uh, is saying, look, I mean, how much more are we going to talk about this stuff? Has it ever benefited the victims of coloniality in Africa? Uh, is it not obscuring uh, some, of the, uh, some of the other aspects of the African condition 
just banging on and on about, about epistemic decolonization. So, so these are the sorts of issues that, uh, that are being uh, wafted around. Right, I'd like to hear a bit more about, about two, two aspects. One is the, the thing that you said at the very end, the people who are saying we have had enough of this philosophical theorizing about epistemic de decolonization. Um, what exactly is the, is the objection? Is the objection that um, you're focusing too much on an rather obscure philosophical internal concern and you should be out there um, fighting the real political struggles? Um, about say <clears throat> voting rights and um, you know um, getting um, correcting for imbalances in the workplace and getting more black people hired, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Is that the objection? No. So I mean, it's 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 quite it's quite an interesting paper that um, um, I mean it kind of shifts between that. And, but but the basic point is that decolonization of any kind is a political project, and just talking about it and, and as a political project, it needs to, to yield uh, positive political results like more justice, more empowerment for, for the victims of colonization and so on. And that just theorizing epistemic decolonization hasn't done any of this. And in fact, it's kind of taking our eye off the real ball of, of political disempowerment, you know, of still economic disempowerment, political disempowerment. Um, and and some and some more dodgy things to my mind at least like so that uh, he argues that it's taking an hour eye of the uh, uh, of the the complicity that Africans have in in their own condition to a certain to a certain extent uh, so for example corruption within Africa and so on right. Um, yeah, so I can see. Yeah. yeah, I can see. I can see the latter point. I don't think I have a very good grasp on the on the former point. So the former point is that don't be so concerned with the conditions of knowledge. That's kind of a distraction. Um, focus more on the places where you can have more direct political input, like like this issue about epistemic decolonizing is like a side issue. That's not really doesn't make much of a difference to people's real lives. Um, I'm not sure that, that he wants to say it's a side issue. So he accepts that it's an important issue um, uh, to decolonize our minds, right? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. but, but that theorizing about it uh, to the extent that we've been doing it is not really doing the job that, that it's, it's, it's meant to be doing. So it's not liberating anyone. It's not, and in right. fact, it's politi politicizing knowledge in a way that that's unacceptable and so on. And, oh, um, interesting. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, as I say, I'm, work I'm working on, on, on a response to this challenge, so, so I, I haven't worked out um, all the things that are wrong with it. But I mean, one thing that is wrong with it, I think, is that it's extremely convenient to the, to the people who have been trying to slow down uh, epistemic decolonization. So that's why mm -hmm. I'm going to um, try, and, try and diffuse it. Right, I see. There's another aspect that kind of interests me because, I mean, let me explain where I'm, where I'm coming from. When we are like um, paying attention more and more to the sort of projects that are happening in the global south, for example, epistemic decolonization and other such projects, one always, of course, in the back of one's mind has the question, what's the relevant to us in our societies? What can we learn from it? Um, what kind of perspective does it force us to confront that in a different form we also have? And one aspect that interests me, because you mentioned that language is an issue. I mean, this is something that is not always so visibly, but this is, one might say, one major cultural um, conflict or confrontation or disagreement that we face in um, European academia, let's say Western and Central European academia, where like for a long time the drive was, was well, let's do more and more in English. Um, let's write about Kant in English, let's write about Hegel in English, um, do our phenomenology in English. That's kind of the gold standard, that, that's the international discussion, that's where we should be at. And then on the other hand, you have those people who are saying, well, why? This is like a bit like a new form of colonialism, that we all, we all have to speak the American and the British and the American academic language, and we should resist that. Now, I have to say that I've always felt uncomfortable about these debates because I see the point of both sides. 
Um, having myself been, you know, trained in a country like Finland, where the, the national language obviously cannot be the language in which they do all their philosophy if they want to have an international impact. And having been in British universities, of course, doing it in English is the most natural thing for me to do. But I've also become a bit more uncomfortable by the other side of that coin, right? So when I listen to like Czech philosophers who don't have that much money, but have to submit all of their application papers in English to the ESC and all these places and feel generally disadvantaged by it. Not to forget, of course, that we have many philosophers here who are saying, look, German is my native tongue. You know, 100 million people in the world speak German. So why shouldn't I do my philosophy in German? As someone who has been here for several years and who has seen a bit of those debates, I mean, in light of your African experience or South African experience, to be precise, how, how does that issue present themselves to you and maybe also to your, to your, to your colleagues? So I think that, I mean, so that's not an issue that we would discuss um, here, right? So, um, uh, but, 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 you know, as you say, as you say having the, the other side, I think that the essential difference between what's going on in, in, in Europe and here is the power differential, right? So it's not, um, so, so to me, I mean, if, even though um, you're forced to do applications in English and so on, and to, you know, to, to, to communicate philosophy in English, um, it's not as though that there's been like a whole history of imposing a whole conceptual framework on you and telling you, here's what real philosophy is, here's what the real problems are, right, in the way that it's been in Africa and, and in South America and, and India and so on. So, so to me, that's the real, the real issue. And one of my biggest revelations about turning to, to political epistemology is that, that these issues are always... Uh, in, sorry, that these epistemological issues are always embroiled in power relations because of the way we are, we are social knowers. So, but that said, um, then when you when you gave the example of more of the like you know the, the Czech and the and you know the, the, the people who haven't been uh, brought up in, in 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 the English tradition, then the power story does begin begin to emerge in the sense um, and a similarity to to our case that th there's a certain gate sort of gatekeeping that goes on um, in, in the English uh, by, the, by the, by at least in Anglo-American um, uh, philosophy, the kind of stuff that, that, that I do, uh, that makes it really impossible for, for African scholars to break through. And it's not just a language issue as in, you know, your English is not good enough because English is a good enough language, but it's the kind of issues, uh, sorry, the, the, you know, most scholars are uh, bilingual in any case, that I know, uh, but but it's the kind of issues that you want to write about as an African philosopher that just don't don't take any uh, get any upkeep, and it, it's kind of complicated because when when you're writing um, when you're writing the same stuff that the Western philosophers are writing, well then it's, it's just more of the same, and and but but if you're not, then you don't get uh, then then you don't get accepted, and okay. I mean I was fighting only the other day with, with an African scholar who was in a talk about global injustice uh, and how to get global justice. And he was using kind of Rosian, the Rosian apparatus. And, and I was like, but, but hang on, what, what makes you so confident that these, <laughs> that these tools that are presumably the very, you know, the, the very uh, uh, originator of the problem are, are going to help you fix it? And he was like, well, these are the best tools we have. And to me, that sounded like, but hold on, you're an African scholar. Why, you know, why are you doing this? So, so I think that the issue of, of gatekeeping is similar, uh, and, and definitely when it comes to English, you know that, that, that the English speakers have the uh, uh, the gate. Yeah. Um, but I think there are also interesting uh, distinctions between between what's happening in Europe and in South Africa, in the sense that there isn't this uh, uh, history of of disempowerment by you know English speakers by the dominant right. language. In this case. Mm -hmm. Okay, maybe, maybe this is the natural point to turn to your work on, on epistemic injustice, actually, because it, it of course, follows immediately on from, from those sorts of issues. Um, I know um, that you have begun to work more and more on that, on that topic. Um, and one inroad that we thought when we were thinking about this ahead of time, what we might be talking about, is this initial question, um, 
if we find that things were epistemically wrong, um, is the language of justice the right language? The reason why I was, well, my memory was triggered to bring this up at this point, because you said a moment ago that Rawls was a potentially, uh, let's say, ambiguous or ambivalent um, position here to, to take up. And of course, the book is called um, Theory of Justice. And um, epistemic injustice, of course, invokes the same idea. Um, so how do you feel about whether um, the language of epistemic injustice is the right language to use? And what is the underlying conception of justice? that we should or shouldn't invoke when we talk about epistemic injustice. Yeah, I, I, I must say that I only became aware of the, the potentially problematic uh, nature of, of using the language of justice, embarrassingly enough, only a few months ago. So uh, Lewis Gordon, the, the, the American race theorist and, and decolonial theorist, was giving a talk here. And I think I've, I've told you the story where um, I suggested some some epistemic, so he, he was trying to collect some tools for critical race theory, and I was like, well, what about some, uh, the, the tool of epistemic uh, exploitation, I think that'll be useful to you, and he, uh, for 10 minutes, then he went on about how epistemic injustice is basically white people stuff, um, and like all of this talk, and so I'm, I'm actually writing a paper at the moment called is epistemic injustice white people stuff, uh, but, but so yeah, so the basic idea, part, part of the idea is, part of the objections, uh, revolve around well, why we're we using this kind of liberal conception of, of um, you know, like why don't we use other conceptions of, of what's involved uh, here of, uh, rather than just injustice. So I don't, I don't have a, a worked out um, theory of justice uh, about what, what kind of notion uh, uh, we're using here, but, but, but I think that um, at least insofar as the debate, the literature in epistemic injustice is concerned, it's not limited to, to just talk of justice. So there's a lot of, uh, there are a lot of other tools I think that are very helpful in thinking about both, whatever you want to call it, epistemic, that thing. Oppression. Um, oppression, oppression or, yeah. uh, so in fact, the epistemic oppression is one of the tools. It's mm. a distinct, you know, it's a, it's a mm. about in that literature. Um, but and and epistemic and and they're very useful for epistemic decolonization as well. So so um, epistemic oppression is one. Um, uh, another one is uh, epistemic exploitation. So that was the, the tool that I stupidly offered to to, to Lewis Gordon. Um, uh, and I mean, should I be explaining these things or? or I don't think uh, epistemic in, injustice. I think this has come up in other contexts. So I think we can sort of assume that people. Um, know what it means. Maybe we home in on the on the issue of, of epistemic injustice though for a moment. Goes back, of course, to the famous book by Miranda Fricker um, called Epistemic Injustice. Um, and um, there the essential example is to kill a mockingbird, right? The essential example is about um, a black man being accused of rape and not being believed by the all white jury in was it 1920s America. Um, so it's interesting that the American race theorist, um, Gordon, that you had mentioned earlier, that he is suspicious of this talk and thinks epistemic injustice is all white people talk, when the central example in Fricker's book is in fact an example involving race. Um, mm. Could you say a little bit more about why some people, him or others, think that epistemic injustice is, as a term or idea, tainted by, by liberal idea? I mean, I have to admit my own naive view and not having worked on this in any detail, my, my unease about it, it's rather that there is no conception of justice or injustice underlying epistemic injustice talk. That it's, it's, I would more say it's the almost total lack of theorizing about it that I find the troubling thing. Less that it is a white person's theory, um, but I may be wrong about this. Maybe, maybe, you, maybe you, you see it completely differently. So help me out. Yeah, I, I, I think that 
Okay, so so one, I mean, so one reason is that that there's a kind of a, I mean, that that the black feminists, for example, had been talking about a lot of this stuff with different labels uh, for a long time. So I mean, the, the, I mean, the two bunches of kind of worries. One of them, which is a matter of fact, has gone right, and how it's been, and I think these are contingent worries that can be fixed. Uh, but yeah, so one in in that group, there's the um, um, uh, the idea that 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 white, you know. The debate has appropriated certain tools that were already there without acknowledging these tools. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so that's that's one reason. Another one is the you know the, the, the very use of the notion of justice uh, that it's you know it's a um, I think that um, David Ludwig also also cited in, in your other interview uh, Audrey Lord's uh, idea that uh, you can dismantle the master's house with the master's tools, right? Uh, so so that's the so so the idea is that. The whole idea of justice is a is a, a liberal tool, the master's tool that that you can't um, uh, you can't really fight you, you can't really uh, fight oppression with. But but actually, the most revealing uh, reason to my to my mind anyway is something that um, in your series that that you and um, the CEU held together, uh, where Gail Poe has spoken of systemic oppression. Oh. Mm -hmm. um, and it's then that I actually clicked what what Lewis was what was really worrying Lewis, uh, uh, Lewis Gordon, sorry. Uh, and that was that I think that by talking about, about epistemic justice, you're kind of forever stuck in the in in the perspective of the oppressor, if you like. So you're worrying certainly in Fricker, and she's been uh, uh, criticized for that. It's it's about. Um, Okay, how do I become more just? How do I uh, clean up epistemically, right? What kind of virtues do I have to have in order to, uh, to overcome this? And, and that's what Gail Polhouse made me realize is that by doing this, you're still just talking about the person you should not be talking about, right? The whole point about addressing these issues is that you need to be thinking about what it's like to be oppressed and how to overcome that and what it's like to live with that. So that's to me that's the most possible objection um, to to epistemic injustice. But there, there's something intrinsically marginalizing about it. I think there are ways of overcoming it, and, and certainly since Fricker, there's been a vast literature with, with many other notions, and uh, not necessarily in terms of justice. But but I think that those are very helpful. Um, I must say though, this point, um, um, I see that also as a contingent feature of the approach rather than something essential to it um, because why why would it have to be that the way to overcome an injustice is to correct the character dispositions of the um, of the oppressor of the one who is committing the injustice um, why couldn't a discourse of justice um, concern the tools and the techniques and the sources of resistance of those who are suffering from it. Um, so I'm, I, I'm, I, I, yeah, it's an interesting question whether talk of justice automatically is linked to these problems that the correction of justice becomes a question of an individual's virtues. That seems to me more a feature of um, Miranda Fricker's approach, mm. specific approach, where she happened to be coming from at the time. Of course, at the, in the meantime, her position is much more broadly based than it than it was then. Of course, a more radical challenge would be like if one were a Marxist. If you are, you know, a classical Marxist, then you would say all talk of justice is just um, bourgeois. Um, the Marxist doesn't talk about just or unjust. The Marxist analyzes the iron laws of history that will lead to the bourgeois system, the capitalist system going, and you know the, the proletariat ruling. Um, so then I can see why one would challenge justice overall. But if you haven't got that kind of a perspective, I find it more difficult to imagine how you, what kind of language would you use if it isn't the language of justice? Yeah, I, I think I think that 
I think I, I tend to agree with you on, on the contingent point, right? That, um, that, that and I, I'm, I'm starting to see this. Uh, I think you, you're right. Um, but I, I also think that, I think that if you were to, let, let's put it this way, okay. So it, I think if there was something objectionable about epistemic injustice talk, it should be, of the intrinsic kind, Some, somehow this kind of talk is intrinsically marginalizing. So I think that let's put it as a challenge to the challenger, right? Mm -hmm. uh, if you want to show why uh, this, is, this is objectionable, you should show that it's somehow intrinsically marginalizing, that it's perpetrating the very oppressions that it's trying to eradicate by virtue of being what it is. So I think that that's, so let's put it as a challenge rather than, than it means. So, so, on your previous question, I think this would be the, the strongest form of the challenge. I'm not sure if it, if, if, if it does exist, but I think that this would be the strongest form of the challenge. And, and, then, and then on the, I mean, the Marx, the Marx point, like I, I'm not, I mean, again, this might be a, a kind of uh, uh, a contingent feature of the debate as well, because there's certain uh, notions of epistemic injustice, like Christy Dodson's uh, contributory injustice, for example, mm -hmm. which wouldn't seem to be uh, 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 prone to this kind of uh, Marxian critique, because for her, contributory injustice just happens when the marginalized uh, don't have, are not allowed, their, their epistemic resources, the resources that they make sense of their own experiences with, are not allowed to, to enter the, the knowledge economy, so to speak. So they're not allowed to contribute to the, to the knowledge economy. Uh, and that seems like, in fact, like nothing that, that intrinsically would be uh, problematic from a Marxian point of view, although I, I'm no expert, so. Well, I mean, there, wouldn't they ultimately um, want to say that we have identified a new form of epistemic injustice, namely that those that are being oppressed, they are, um, sense-making tools are not allowed to be part of the broader debate of sense-making, or would they describe it? I mean, I've, I have read the Dodson paper because I have a PhD student working on it, and in that context I've read it, but I don't recall whether she would want to say that this is a whole separate issue from like epistemic injustice, or whether she wants to say I've identified a new form of epistemic injustice. I don't think she wants to. No, I don't think she wants to, to say that it's a it's a different form of, uh, that that it's not a kind of epistemic, uh, not a kind of injustice at all. No, uh, I think it's more like there's a, a new form of injustice. Mm -hmm. but, but the point is, and, and maybe just this just goes back to your previous um, comment on how little theorized the notion of justice is in these debates, because it's. I mean, by by the time we're talking about, I mean, a lot of things fall fall under the under this label. Uh, so. Yeah. Um, so, so maybe, maybe it's just a, I mean, maybe it's just a red herring. Okay, so yeah, okay, they say justice and, and injustice, but um, there's there's so much stuff falling under it that that would be compatible with a non-liberal, uh, non, you know, or Marxist framework that that we should really not worry about it. Uh, and as you but, say, or the rather way the we, other way around, that that we should worry about using a term that we have so little theorized. <laughs> or that or we could, because know. because i mean I, then i could see like a kind of an ideology critique setting mm -hmm. in that when you think you already know what the term means that's when you are most likely to simply fall back on uh, mainstream traditional um, understandings of justice that may well be complicit in forms of oppression that you want yeah. to get rid of Mm -hmm. Yeah, I haven't thought of that. But There's yeah. also another form of critique of like injustice than what could think of. And again, your reference to Rawls makes me makes me think of it. And this is how Raymond Goyce, the, the Cambridge um, political philosopher, criticizes Rawls. He has various forms of criticism, but one criticism is that um, Rawls unduly narrows the scope of political philosophy that there are many things that political philosophers should worry about and justice is just being is just one of them like you know welfare and health and many many issues that can be theorized and talked about without immediately talking about 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 justice um i mean i don't know is that 
is is that a concern that um, some of the people that you talk to have about that justice gets too great a significance? And no, 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 not that I'm aware. No, I mean, I no, I don't, I don't think that's the that, that is a concern. But I, yeah. Okay, I, I good, great. Um, have we talked a fair bit about about um, about epistemic injustice? Have I? Um, have you? You told me that you're working on a paper on it, and um, that was something we wanted to explore. Um, do you want us to tell a bit more about the about the paper you're you're working on? Um, no, I mean I'm still um, as 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 it goes uh, battling through the, these issues. I'm I'm giving a, a talk next next week on on the topic at, at uh, well at Oxford. At Oxford Zoom, uh, and uh, I, I'm hoping that I'll get some feedback on it, and, and then I'll be able to, to to take it further. But but at the moment I'm um, and I yeah, and I really like what you said about about the under theorization of, of justice and how the problem might be actually coming from that mm. uh, that we're forced into fa falling back on these preconceived notions of it. Um, but I I think I think I need to think more about it in in in, in, in light of that. Mm -hmm. We've talked a fair bit about, about epistemic injustice. We haven't said anything about hermeneutic injustice. Um, does that play a separate role in your arguments or are you, are you subsuming that? I mean, I could imagine that some of the language issues, for example, that you previously talked about, um, you know, imposing a certain conceptual grid um, from, say, Anglo Anglo-Saxon philosophy onto the African mind. Um, um, is that something that plays a role in, in your argument? Yeah, so I mean, I was just assuming that it's it's a form of, I mean, as the literature does, uh, it's a form of uh, uh, epistemic injustice. And and I do, I mean, it's it's actually a different, uh, a different piece of, of work. And at the moment, I'm really working on, on kind of connections between uh, between these debates, uh, epistemic decolonization and injustice, uh, and and more mainstream analytic analytic debates, um, and 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 one of the things I'm working on is precisely on hermeneutical injustice and a version of it. So, uh, what Charles Mills calls white white ignorance. Mm -hmm. So, um, and I think it's it's actually just a species of of Gail Paulhouse's hermeneutical uh, mm -hmm. willful hermeneutical ignorance. Mm -hmm. uh, so the idea that we deliberately, as as wh white people, we're deliberately ignoring uh, resources and aspects of reality that that help us maintain our uh, uh, white privilege and make us feel kind of sanitized of debt to colonialism and so on. And um, and and so I think that that's a really important form of of hermeneutical injustice that um, that can be used very nicely actually in in, mo in Topical debates at the moment. So, uh, one debate that um, uh, uh, I've just used it on is on uh, the irrationality of beliefs. I'm not sure if you know uh, Lisa Bertolotti's work on epistemic innocence. No. So, but but anyway, so so the idea is that that you you certain of our mainstream ideas because they get developed with a very individualistic way of thinking about the knowing subject. Mm -hmm. end up saying things like, um, for example, I, I mean, I argue in, the, in this piece that, that uh, her idea of epistemic innocence has the implausible result that, that uh, white ignorant beliefs are epistemically innocent. So I think there's a lot of scope for, for using uh, notions of, of hermeneutical injustice uh, to, to think about the way, the way current uh, mainstream analytic epistemology debates are run. Uh, and so epistemic blame in particular. I think is a, a really interesting area too. Interesting. Mm -hmm. um, now um, I shift. Um, I shift gear a little bit. Um, um, there are two, if I understand correctly, two big epistemic issues that you have um, discussed in the context of the um, decolonizing project. One is to do with epistemic injustice, and we've just gone over it. But there's another, a second major leg to your efforts, and this is to engage with um, relativistic themes that play a role in these um, decolonization debates in, in the African context. Could you say a little bit about the, the context of your contribution and then give us a, 
a brief summary. I say brief summary simply for our listeners who are interested in this topic in particular. There are already on YouTube two lectures that Belly has given, one at the LSE and the other one was her inaugural lecture in Johannesburg that go over this topic in greater detail. So maybe this is just this is just an appetizer for those who want to um, who want to learn more about this. So go ahead. Yeah, I should say I'm, I'm pretty nervous about talking about this in front of you, uh, the, the the relativism guru. So, uh, but but so the basic idea was that um, I, I just kept hearing these, um, hearing and reading these justifications for epistemic decolonization, which which said stuff like colonialism has committed epistemicide. Okay, tick. Yeah. Um, and so the, the way to reverse it is to treat the um, African and, and other uh, oppressed perspectives uh, as equal, right? To restore, in order to restore epistemic authority to, to, the, to, the, uh, uh, to the peoples from whom it was stolen, you need to treat uh, competing epistemic perspectives on a particular issue as equal. And, and so, so I got, I got annoyed about it after a while because most of, most of the people working in, in, on these issues are not philosophers. Um, and I just wanted to say, look, this is an old debate in philosophy. You cannot just make these claims without realizing what, what the consequences are. Uh, and and to, to my mind, the biggest consequence is that if you're a relativist um, of a particular kind, a metaphysical relativist, then, then you're just undermining your own project because because if you if you think of uh, 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 of people's perspectives as equal, competing perspectives as equal, then then you can't really um, uh, have absolute truths about what's morally right and wrong. Um, and and this is of course the very baby version, but uh, but but that was the motivation. And then in 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 the paper that that I wrote on this topic. Um, and go through various more sophisticated ways of, of handling this, this kind of uh, objection. Um, and, and I guess I end up um, hopefully dismissing more, uh, the more sophisticated versions. But that's why I say I get nervous talking about, about this to you because uh, no doubt you will pull out your relativist uh, <clears throat> uh, spade and, and um, destroy it so they were no 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 relativism goes with tolerance so of <laughs> course i tolerant intellectuals it's my truth <laughs> okay so anyone who wants to learn more about belly's arguments on this point do rush to the um videos on youtube uh, <laughs> that are beautifully clear and very well laid out so you at the same time get a nice introduction into some um versions of um, relativism but I want to use the, the remaining time to, to take you to yet another one of your projects, also broadly related to the topics we, we are discussing here, namely the project on, um, um, what's it called, the, the Geography of Philosophy project. Um, could you say a little bit about what that project is at first before we go into the, into the, into the details? Sure. So it's uh, it's a Templeton funded project that's that's based in the in the US. But it's uh, so the, the PI is at, uh, Steve Stitch, uh, Edouard Machiri, and uh, Clyde Barrett. Um, and the point of the project is to explore three uh, epistemology concepts: knowledge, understanding. Um, knowledge, understanding. What is the third? Truth, evidence. No. <laughs> <laughs> okay, there's a third one. <laughs> as I speak, I'm sorry. No um, worries, go on. Uh, uh, no, it, it's it's worries. Uh, Memory is going. There we go. Uh, so so there, there are nine themes around the world. So it's and the idea is to to, to explore cultural va variations uh, amongst these concepts. Uh, so it's it's in broadening the area of experimental philosophy, um, and I'm the the South African team leader here. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, who can't remember the third concept, uh, but so so that's so that's the basic the basic idea of the, of the project. So have you been taking like like Getia Getia style um, stories to non philosophers to to test their their intuitions? Yeah, so um, it's 
so we, I mean, the, the, the various types of studies, some of them are vignettes, uh, and others are actually watching videos and so on. But, but um, uh, yeah, so uh, some of it, at the moment, we're working on stuff on the fictivity, on the fictivity of knowledge. Wisdom, sorry, the third one is wisdom. Wisdom, wisdom. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> my name is a philosopher, it's forgotten. Right? <laughs> uh, philosophy, yes, wisdom. Uh, sorry about this. And um, so, so, um, at the moment, we're working on, on active intuitions about knowledge uh, and understanding, so and, <laughs> and not wisdom, just knowledge and understanding. Um, and have, and there been surprising, is, have there been surprising results? I mean, things that kind of surprised you that you wouldn't have expected? Um, for, um, for, our, for our studies, not so much. I think that the South American colleagues discovered certain interesting things uh, about knowledge. So like um, in, um, in the Shua, in the Peru and Ecuador, uh, some, some of the concepts are actually, the knowledge concept is tied with perception so that um, I can't really be said to know um, that, um, I don't know that your daughter is next door. If you tell me this without actually having seen it, um, and and I understand that there are some concepts in uh, in Malawi as well, some 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 languages that they have a similar thing, uh, which which is interesting because because there are um, some African epistemologists want to draw a very close connection between knowledge and perception, and like kind of a hardcore empiricism that. So, so that's that's quite interesting. On the fictivity, we haven't uh, discovered anything, and we haven't discovered anything of this kind in the in the Bantu languages with which the Southern African languages with which we're we're working. Um, but that I mean that might be partly a function of of the way things are set up, right? So um, they're very much set up with with a kind of Western framework in mind. So we're testing particular intuitions, like you say, get the effectivity, right? And and um, which may be simply um, barking up the wrong tree, you know, like as far as um, as far as uh, other languages are concerned. So, so I think that we have actually a very beautiful opportunity here to 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 design to 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 think about how to how to design these studies with a more of a local eye, right? You know, with an eye to to the local frameworks of these languages. If so, we, so how would it how would it look like if you if you used a more local framework? Um, to to inquire into people's understanding of knowledge. Oh, I have no idea. Of course. Okay. But I mean, if it, if it turns out that that uh, so I mean so so okay so here's one thing that, that definitely came up in in our case that um, that there are different sources of knowledge. So one thing that one would want to think about is don't go into the field with just this idea that sources of knowledge have to be your bunch of sources of knowledge. Because one, one thing that we've discovered is that um, um, ancestral voices are a big source of knowledge as far as, as, far as many uh, African countries and certainly in Southern Africa are concerned. Mm -hmm. um, and, so, and so one would want to design a study with, with that in mind, right? So what kind of knowledge do, do you get? Is it different from, from the kind of knowledge that, that you get from, I don't know, from your dad or whatever, right? And, and, right. Um, yeah, that's fascinating. Yeah. Um, so, right. So they have different sources of knowledge that would not even be counted as sources of knowledge in like the main way in which Westerners would, would frame it. Um, yeah. Um, I mean, do you find the, 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 the design in the first place that you give people vignettes that they have to respond to? Um, do you find something intrinsically um, potentially, now potentially problematic about about that, or like the the questionnaire methods. I mean, I'm I'm you know I'm minded here of like um, anthropologists because before the philosophers came along and tried to find their epistemic terms in different parts of the world, anthropologists have of course always been thinking about terms like souls, how, how is the concept of soul understood in different um, cultures, um, uh, how, is, how is meta understood, you know, these more basic metaphysical categories have of course always fascinated anthropologists. And the more traditional way of doing it is you had your questionnaire and you went out and you had a checklist. Whereas the more recent view would be that this is a hopeless strategy. Um, 
for a number of reasons, but one thing you should rather do is like take narratives from that cultures um, and rather through a textual analysis of texts that they themselves produce and feel happy and comfortable with, that that should be the starting point, rather how do we get them to fit into our questionnaire boxes? And I'm sometimes a little surprised that the, um, the experimental philosophy crowd um, is still so much wedded to these um, easily quantifiable um, questionnaire methods um, that you mentioned also seem to be prevalent when they come to South Africa to do their research. Yeah, so, so first of all, let me preface this that I, I'm not doing the experimental work myself. So I have an amazing postdoc, Jo Rea, who, who does, who's a sociologist, in fact. So, oh, she, so she, yeah, so she's trained in all of these uh, uh, fine, fine details. But as far as I understand it, uh, and this is a, I think this is an objection that, that comes up often anyway, is that, yeah, the, part of the problem is that we're not going to, I don't know, to poetry and to, to, to um, 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 praise songs and so on to find out from there first what kind of uh, what kind of thing we should be looking for. So that's part of the problem. Another part of the problem, and I don't think there's anything intrinsically wrong with the vignettes, but but my postdoc tells me that some of the philosophers' vignettes just don't make any sense to a non-philosopher, right? So you know, if, for example, you know those Gettier things where you just like vary a little bit one sentence, so you give the same vignette six times and you ask people to decide whether this person knows or doesn't know. Yeah. Like, you know the wife is in the room she's not in the room she said like most people just glaze over it when, when she talks to them they're like but you just give me the same story like why am i why are you wasting my time right yeah. so, <laughs> and, and this is even so we we, we do stuff with student populations uh, participants as well as um, non-student participants and uh and she said, like, uniformly, people just blaze off. I mean, even in her case, it was like, are you guys okay? Because <laughs> what are we doing here? Yeah. So, so it's also the kind of vignette. So one, so one objection is, yeah, go to the, you know, to the traditional texts first and see, see what people are talking about before you start testing these intuitions. Mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, the other one is philosophers' vignettes are just, well. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, you already need to have a philosopher's training to understand the vignettes addressed allegedly to non-philosophers. Right? Yeah. yeah, and of course we all make the experience when, when in our first year courses we have to teach the Gettier cases how much hard work it is to simply elicit in the students the intuition they allegedly all automatically ought to have, right? <laughs> <laughs> So I can I can see that the difficulties multiply if you go to a different linguistic community with its own conventions and they don't they are not in the Western philosophy course in the first place, right? Yeah. So yes, okay. Well, um, we have covered a fair amount of, of of material. It's utterly fascinating. I'm sure we could easily talk for another hour or two or three or four, and I look forward to doing that when you will be in Vienna from next summer for a while anyway very much looking forward to do that um a hint to our viennese friends make sure you you get in touch with Belly when she's here but for today i think we finish here um thank you Belly, for 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 coming along and for telling us so much interesting um about interesting debates and papers on projects in the in the south african philosophical context so thank you very much and thank you all for, for watching, and we very much look forward to seeing you in our next video. Bye-bye.